Hello, everybody, and welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around fantasy Premier League. My name's Serge. And my name is James. Off we go again. I feel all right, you know. I'm getting better slowly and surely, but, you know, people say, oh, you don't sound too bad. I'm like, when I actually have conversations and do this kind of stuff, I go all in, and then at the end of it, I'm knackered. <laughs> we are yeah. doing all right. I also do a lot of silent in of your coffin. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, occasionally, try, if I get I'll, time. I'll try, I'll try and self, self-regulate self uh, by pressing mute on the mic. It's no, don't do that, because you'll forget. <laughs> nine, uh, nine out of ten games in Game Week 20 gone. Yeah, I thought we'd I thought we'd go early with this one because it's bad to go bad for me tonight, probably. So I thought we'd just skip that and pretend it doesn't happen. Um now the thinking more bad, is like bad just 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 to be clear, bad from a football point of view, not an FPL point of view, is what uh, you're saying. Because if it goes badly from a FPL point of view, a football point of view, it's gone well from an FPL point of view because you no. own Double Not, Liverpool. Yeah, I've, I've also got Harry Kane <laughs> though, mate. Um I don't care how it goes from an FPL perspective tonight. I obviously care how my team do. Uh, we decided to go early because of the tight turnaround of deadlines and stuff. I'll cover Tottenham Liverpool tonight on my stream tomorrow and we'll do the same next Thursday and stuff as well. So it'll be two full pods next Monday and Thursday as well. We'll do the same thing next week. How was your game week, sir? It's going well. Uh, 57 points so far. Uh, a game week rank of 464k. So I'm just touching the top million. I think after tonight, depending on how things go with uh, Salah and Robertson, I could end up back inside the top million. So that's a rise from 1.3 to 1 million. So 300k rise is decent. I'm back to where I was before my infamous missing the uh, free hit chip. And we build from there. But yeah, it started really well, obviously, with uh, uh, losing my Sufal clean sheet points very quickly got counteracted by Suchek. Uh, so from the big hitters this week, we had obviously Suchek, Rafinha, Cancelo. Um, who else went big? Gundogan. Gundogan and so on. I had two of them, Cancelo and Suchek. So Cancelo did all right for me and Suchek did okay. And Antonio got me the assist. Um, but I did have blanks from Bamford, Dallas and Sufal. And then Ariola came in with a 10-pointer yesterday. Very nice. And we all obviously had the blanks from Bruno Fernandes. I've owned Marcus Rashford for, for three matches now and he's given me three blanks so i'm not too happy with our boy marcus rashford it's a mixed 57 it's not bad though 57 on an average of 32 and i'm pretty sure when i checked on live fpl.net the top 10k average is around 45 or something along those it was lines. around so, there yeah yeah 57 is is decent at the moment it is, yeah. It was a, a good week to have some differentials go off. I mean, we mentioned a few players. Uh, no one's got Dwight McNeil, but a few people have Bukayo Saka. Yeah. So if you've got a combination of these boys who've done really well, you probably had a good game week. I mean, captaincy for the majority of people was immaterial. Highest ever captains since official FPL have been recording captaincy stats. And wow. not, not even close. It was uh, 2.8 million for Bruno Fernandes. And I think the previous most was like 2.1 million or something. It wow. wasn't even close. It was huge. Um, so it didn't matter from an FPL perspective what he did. Obviously, for those who captained someone else, it did matter. And for those who captained someone like Cancelo, obviously well done. But for every Cancelo story, there's a Phil Foden story. My game week's gone well. 60. Not even that, Jace. For every Yeah, that is true where people have captained the City asset that didn't go well. Um, there's a hell of a lot of benching stories as well this week that are quite scary. Yes, true. Oh, I've seen some teams with nearly 40 on the bench. Ouch. Yeah, uh, it's easy done, isn't it? Suchek, Rafinha yeah. and a defensive yeah. clean sheet or something. Uh, I'm a 60. Some good returns. Started Suchek and Rafinha myself. Antonio's assist, which we'll talk about because Antonio probably should have been the highest scorer of the whole game. Really. <laughs> Massively. Uh, clean sheets for Stones and Diaz. I bought Ruben Diaz rather than Cancelo. No real regrets on that. As I explained in my stream on Tuesday, the decision was more of a, a long-term thinking towards doubles. I would rather have the security of the main guy defensively in Ruben Diaz. Nice bonus last night with Ariola's 10-pointer in goal. Really nice. So I'm on 60 with... The same two as yourself, Robertson and Salah and Harry Kane to go as well. Good week. We did talk to... about 
346k currently now. It's decent. Good, good climb. We we talked about uh, Burnley beating Villa on the uh, Patreon show, the differential show, and I said it's going to be one nil because Chris Wood's going to score because I've benched him and he's first on my bench with eight points this week. Just wow, before I wow, sell him. Wow. Just before I sell him. <laughs> Made any transfers yet? No, no, no. I'd like to start getting into the habit of rolling, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit. Because yes, I as would we like approach 23, 24, but there are still fires I need to put out and things I need to think about. My squad's would... lined up quite well, but um, Chris Wood to Ollie Watkins seems a pretty simple transfer for me at the moment. Watkins' numbers was looking at some interesting numbers. Uh, in fact, I'll cover that quickly. I was looking at some some numbers from since Manchester City lost to Tottenham. So it's that period of game week 10 to game week 20. Uh, I think I might be right in saying Ollie Watkins has had the highest XG over those 11 game weeks, I think. Um, wow. Which is, I mean, it's a, he's a sustainable player at his value, right? Yeah, he can frustrate a few times, but I mean, his goal that he got at Burnley, the other night, it was lovely to get across the front, a beautiful little finish. Could have had more as well, missed a one-on-one. So I think Watkins is a reasonable shout for you, especially knowing with Villa as well. I mean, it's 99% certain they'll have a, du- have a double in game week 26. Fixtures aren't the worst either. So I can see that. In that period, so game week 10 to game week uh, 20, Bruno Fernandes is the highest scoring FPL player. And he scored five Premier League goals in that time. You know, the only two players have got more than five. Goals? Yeah, five goals scored. Yeah, definitely Suchek because he's on seven Premier League goals now. So it'll be him. Suchek's six in that period, yeah. Not Ollie Watkins. Who's been banging in the goals? It's not a forward, mate. Um, since game week from game week ten to game week uh, twenty. Yep. Gundogan. Gundogan has seven. Mm. Yeah, and I've gone for a bit of Gundogging myself because he's already in. I've I've bought him. I've seen enough. No regrets on not buying him the other day because had I bought him, I would have bought him most likely for Rafinha, so it wouldn't have made a huge difference to no, my score for the game week. Um, but that's the transfer I've now made. Thank you very much for Rafinha for your returns at Newcastle the other night. And thank you very much for uh, the return at West Brom a couple of weeks ago. That's it. It's done its job. Um, I, I, I mean, if it's Gundogan versus Rafinha, I can't really argue at the moment. So I've made that that straight transfer to get it in. Gundogan and Suchek, the two highest goal scorers in the last 11 weeks of the Premier League, and they're both priced at roundabouts. What is it between 5.3 well, and 5.6? Uh, yeah, 5357 five, Gundogan's got up to now. Gundogan. Let's call him Gundogan. I'm going to stop disrespecting his name. Um, he's he's just a machine. Uh, do you have any fear around Gundogan's rotation? I mean, none for this weekend. We've been getting subbed on 55 minutes against West and Brom. Do you have any fear of his attacking returns drying up? Yeah, the attacking returns could dry up. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I think you'd have to look beyond it and say, I mean, look, I'll put my hands up and say I was first asked about him about five, six game weeks ago. And when I was asked, the question started with, don't laugh, but I'm interested in Gundogan. So we all had a little bit of a laugh about it. And it, feels like, it feels like he scored every week since. It's not It's not started a few weeks ago. It started a few years ago. Like for, for, for history, we've always said Gundogan not worth it in FPL. Um, but we've always said he's one of Pep's favourites and he still keeps getting minutes. And now the attacking returns have started coming. It's It was... Obviously, t- Tuesday night was the first game without KDB as well. So, I mean, we we thought sort of thought that him and Bernardo would play ahead of Rodri, which is what it was. And I think that's going to be the first choice, generally speaking, while KDB's out injured. KDB being out injured means I think he's on the pens as well, Gundogan. Yeah, he's on many of the free kicks from the edge of the box as well, um, and he's he's playing really high up. I mean, I love that the second goal that he got on Tuesday night, where he's pressing. We took we've spoken so much about Man City not being able to press the way they used to. That was an old Man City goal, going and yeah. pressing and winning the ball high, and then once he gets there, he's got the composure. Within five seconds later, it's in the back of the net. Yeah, he's a really calm finisher. His confidence is up at the price. It's it's also low risk, right? So he's in at the moment and that's the way it's going to stay, certainly for the, the time being, I think. And then look, we'll reassess once KDB's back fit at sort of around about 24 or so. I felt it was better for me to have an attacking city rather than the treble up defensively, personally. 
Yeah, agreed. I, I was really looking at uh, taking a hit to get Foden in as the, the only other move I would have made this week. Glad I didn't in the end. And what I saw there with Pep pulling him off early put me off a little bit, a little bit. He still had a decent game. I mean, Foden is a threat at any time and there's not a lot of difference between Gundogan and, and Foden. I, I see the arguments for Gundogan. I'm still slightly more tempted with Foden because I feel like the attacking returns are more consistent over a longer period, whereas Gundogan could dry up. And if everybody's gravitating towards Gundogan now, there's less of an advantage, whereas if Foden pops off, then I can start making ground. Yeah, get that. I still I think mean, <clears throat> Foden is, is likely to play whilst KDB is out as well. Gund- Gundogan's points this week can easily be Foden's next week. Um, but they exactly. could also they could also easily be Ferran Torres's, for example. They could be Bernardo Torres. Silva's. So we we know this with City that what, what happened this week may well be something different next week. So if you've got Phil Foden or something, you think, oh my god, I, I wouldn't move. There's no point jumping between them. We have this conversation so much about City assets. Yeah, we've spoken a lot about say Salah and Mane in the past. Whoever you've gone for, stick it out. If your guy's in the team at the moment, I wouldn't worry about it. Phil Foden could easily get a nice little return at the weekend. He's City's top scorer, I think, in all comps. Yes, uh, I don't, I don't think that Gundogan's pulled that level. Not yet, no. If you'd have said to me at the start of the season, I'd have had Gundogan. I'd, have, I'd have laughed at you. <laughs> Honestly, to be honest with you, I, I, I would have probably said, "Who's he playing for?" If you just, I, I would have yeah, said maybe, move yeah, maybe yeah. Has, he, has he gone to Arsenal and he's playing really high up as a 10 or something like that. Honestly, I just can't believe that that would have been the attacking Man City player that I would have wanted and ever chosen. But I don't think he looked beyond it now. Was it like seven goals in eight or something? It's mad. It is. Uh, shall we run down the nine games that we've had just uh, uh, so far this game week? The usual drill, see if there's any assets or anything from an FPL point of view that is putting its hand up at the moment. Um, the table, the Premier League table, is really starting to take some shape at the bottom. Um, first, come, I was going to say in first place it has. <laughs> <laughs> and and also top four, really, but uh, that's soon to change tonight. But, uh, so maybe not quite top four. Um, but yeah, at the bottom, it is starting to take shape. And there are certain sides that are really not appealing um, from an FPL point of view. I understand that doubles and blanks can, can affect our thought process around certain sides but I think when we look at it what I've learned and you probably have learned as well is like Shane Duffy stuff right just because Brighton have a double they're still shit or just you because get, you can get have bogged a down and obsessed with it yeah, yeah oh they've got a double let me just get their striker it's still crap mate. so I'm gonna try and um not get sucked into into that too much this time and stick with consistent players i'd rather a single game day of antonio than a double game with a mope and that kind of stuff you know um so. well that's that's part of the reason why i sold rafinha rather than the other the other one i could have sold i mean the other two were to yeah. or adamo lookman but i decided i really i really want not lookman this weekend away to west brom i don't feel like the timing of that transfer is right whereas going back to the week that we're obviously kind of still in I didn't want to sell Rafinha before he played Newcastle. I'm looking yeah. at it now and going, okay, Leicester, Everton next two. Yes, Leeds could have a double in 26 and play in 29, which for me on my strategy would be ideal to keep that kind of player. And the strategy idea, it would have actually been better for me probably to sell Suchek. But I don't want to sell Suchek, right? I no, want him to be part sense. of my squad. Yeah, Ironically, yeah. Uh, I mean, we joked about it last week. If he blanks against West Brom, don't worry about it. Everyone will bench him next week and we'll have his points against Palace. I'm yep. probably I'm probably going to bench him this week, ironically. <laughs> but I, that's not a player I want to lose. Like They've got Fulham in 23, Sheffield United in 24. I don't really want to lose him. So no, I, I just think he's, he's, he's going to go up in value more. I've had him at five all season. I don't really want to move him on. And at least until I know whether they're in 26 or 29. And if they haven't got the double in 26, on my strategy, he sits on the bench. Yeah. Man City away, fine. Sit on the bench, good. I'll have you for the little run up to 29. And and with him, you can always make the choice whether you play him or not. This week, it's worked out for me, obviously, to play him. There's a lot of people in my ear going, mm, you got to play Sufal rather than Suchek. Why? Mm. I'm, I'm, I, in nine out of 10 cases, I'm always going to pick Suchek over Sufal, personally. Because yep. West Ham have had three clean sheets in a row. 
yeah, I'll, I'll still see some sloppiness on Tuesday night from you, which is a nice segue, actually, James. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> Let's talk about the games. I mean, yes, there, there, there are... Um, I, I, I think we can talk about Palace 2, West Ham 3. That was not a 3-2 game. Um, but no, United you should have won by more. Yeah, plenty more. Uh, we did concede an, an early goal that was a well-taken goal by Wilf Zaha and was decent, but also... Uh, slightly sharper in the first two, three, four minutes of a game. Um, in difficult conditions, we could have stopped that goal and uh, played till the 96th minute and we would have stopped the other, the other goal as well. So, yeah, I, I think with West Ham, we will still continue to see clean sheets. Um, but there's a difficult run coming up now. Um, we play Man City, like you said, we've got Liverpool, we've got Tottenham and Man City a few games after that. Villa are difficult, United, Leeds, they're all attacking teams. So, I don't think we'll be keeping as many clean sheets in the next 10 as we have in the last 10. Um, so it is, it, I see what you're saying there. Definitely, Suchek. Ultimately, um, it was a good performance from West Ham. Controlled the game, controlled the middle of the park after the first five minutes. Rice and Suchek really were able to dominate MacArthur and, and Milivojevic. And we ended up with good progressive build-up play and, and created some very, very good chances in the end that could have scored five or six. Antonio could have hauled again. I mean, he he's looking fit. He's looking sharp and at oh, his value. No. He, we no wanted him when to, I want you when to I say, say he's tired. tired. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean, he looked frustrated at not scoring. No doubt about that. Um, and so would you be. If you hit the post twice and the goalkeeper pulls the world, you're off the line. An instinct reaction. You're going to be... It's not your day. It's not he your should day. have hauled big time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think if, if so many people still sitting on double, triple West Ham, from the double game week and what have you, uh, are happy with that. And, and so you should be. I think there's still good results to be had, um, good momentum at West Ham. And yeah, I think the price point versus the value is is perfect. It's a perfect storm with West Ham. Yeah, I think where I'm at with it at the moment is Sufal is probably regularly going to sit on the bench for me at the moment. Yeah. I'll move on when I want to, when the time's right. There's a good chance against Fulham and Sheffield United in 23 and 24 I'll play him. Otherwise, he's probably going to sit on the bench for me. Suchek, I want to play most game weeks, but there are certain ones like this weekend, I'm not bothered about leaving him out. Yeah, his probably best case scenario is he scores. He's not going to get two very often anyway, right? No, no. Antonio plays every week, immaterial of opposition. Correct. That's where exactly I'm at that. with it at the moment. Yeah, you don't need to overthink it any more than that. Um, and if you're a goal, if you own Fabianski or whoever else, yeah, fine. Creswell again picking up an assist. Cre yeah, Creswell fine. is a far more difficult one to leave out, I think. Oh yeah, and, because and, of the uh, set pieces. And I mean, particularly tactics. obviously uh, instead of Sufal, but ironically, probably he's more difficult to leave out than Suchek. Actually, I mean, he's got another assist here. The first, the, the the second time Antonio hit the post would have been an assist for him as well. <laughs> yeah, because he scuffed his shot. <laughs> Correct. Um, but it was a very similar to Suchet's goal at, at Everton, actually, wasn't it? The actual yeah, the build of yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so he's still well involved. I think he's, am I right saying he's a high scoring FPL defender? I feel like I want to say uh, at the moment. I'm going to check that for you. Is he? He's a harder one to leave out at the moment, I'd say. Correct. At 5.5 million, he has 92 FPL points. Yeah. I mean, what a fucked up season this is, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> what about Palace? Uh, Zaha came back in and, and you know, with Benteke, Zaha and Eze, they do cause problems. They do create chances at any moment. I was very impressed with the way they, they, they get from back to front quite quickly when, when they have it. They move the ball to the final third very quickly. And then they're, they're very tricky customers. Some of these players are quite skillful, but they just need more incisiveness in the final third. They just, you can't be taking shots from outside the box all the time and, uh, and that kind of thing. You need to create better quality chances is what Palace really need. They've got a brilliant run. A brilliant run of fixtures. Um, that Wolves next, which with their change of system, I wouldn't be keen to dive into. But then after that, I mean, Newcastle leads the next two. From an attacking perspective in this league, those almost feel like the two best teams to target at the moment. We know Leeds are a very good side. But we also know that attacking players can score good FPL returns against Leeds. Newcastle, Leeds, Burnley, Brighton, Fulham is then is their next five after Wolves. Even after that, it's Tottenham, then West Brom. If Manchester United beat West Ham in, in the FA Cup 
fifth round. It also means a double for them in 26, which would be Fulham at home and Manchester United at home. The problem is you're not going to find out about that till before the 24 deadline. Um, that's one fixture that's almost definitely going to go into 26 if it's postponed. We can't guarantee that all the 29 postponements will go into 26. But for that particular fixture, it's 99% certainty that it would go in there, I'd say. So there we, Zaha particularly is interesting. It also makes Tyreek Mitchell quite interesting. I think particularly for those who are thinking about the bench boost, like I've, I've, I don't know if he's up to 4.0 yet. If he's if he is great, if he's not, he will be very soon just because of his price and he's playing regularly. He they're really interesting actually. Zaha's going to frustrate. I don't think I can do it to myself again. I'd rather just not bother. I think I'd rather look back on it with regret and go, yeah, we identified them fixtures, but I didn't go for it. I think rather than going for it and him pissing me the fuck off like he normally does when I own him. That's how I feel about it at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's his price, 7.2 million. It's a bit of a funny one. He sits in the category of a Grealish or a, a Madison or whatever. You'd rather just have the peace of mind. I'd of those rather guys. have Grealish with, with tougher fixtures and at least know that I'll enjoy watching him play football. Exactly. It's the peace of mind kind of thing in the back of your head, right? I mean, Zaha needs to sort his temperament out. We talked about it on Tottenham yesterday I just think he's never going to be a great because he lets himself get wound up too easily and then once he he is he's just off the boil he's just off the boil and then you know you can um, get at him and he's not going to be able to hurt you so yeah Zaha is a bit of a problem there's no one else at City really Tyrek Mitchell yeah you're right um and Zaha maybe Eze like he's less than one percent owned and if you really fancy the punt but 5.8 million Gundogan's cheaper Suchek is cheaper you I don't see why Rafinha, you'd want Eze. Saka. Yeah, I, I don't see uh, why even Smith Rowe, if you really fancy going, really uh, might might have picked up a knock. And apparently Arteta ah. said that he had been carrying an injury, so you wouldn't go near okay, him. Okay, so maybe not. So, but but they're all better options in yeah, my opinion 100%. than Eze. Yeah, you wouldn't. Uh, pick... As much as I like Eze, I think he's he's, he's yeah, a good so do I. Character, but Love him, not, great. Not player. for this game. Newcastle lead didn't pop off as crazily as it could have done. Uh, fascinating game. I obviously watched this one while he was watching West Ham. Uh, Newcastle were non-existent in the first half. Uh, really bad. As Leeds, expected. Uh, I mean, from <laughs> that perspective, yeah. Leeds probably should have had the game won. Um, lovely goal by Rafinha, uh, which was very well set up by Rodrigo, actually, because he did, the, the pass he originally received from Bamford wasn't good and they composed themselves in the right area. Um Ailing, Dallas, both could have got near attacking returns in that first half particularly. But the second half was a different football match. And it was a different football match because Newcastle decided they were going to have a go. And they just did small things like putting pressure on the ball. I mean, they changed system as well. They played five at the back again. And in the back four in the second half, they basically put Isaac Hayden right back and went for it a little bit. And they just looked a bit more energised about it. And then St. Maximin came on with half hour to go. And he just ran at them. Leeds have a huge issue with people running at them in central areas, not so much in wide areas, in central areas. If, you, if you've got someone in there who can carry the ball, you'll get 30, 40 yards on them quite easily because Phillips just gets so isolated in that area, right? Because they, they push they men forward and they go and yep. press the ball. If you break the press, you really can run at Leeds. And that always makes a game quite interesting. And St. Maxim, when he came on, he just started running at them, right, from everywhere. And it was from that perspective, it was quite an enjoyable second half. The goal comes about because Jamal Lascelles goes and presses the ball and wins a tackle 30 yards from goal. And that summed up the way Newcastle played in the second half in terms of how they went and hunted the thing. It was like, it's something about playing Leeds that at certain points in games just draws teams into a fight. Now, quite often, Leeds will outplay you and then you're in big trouble because they then get the overloads on the counter and stuff. But for small periods of this, Newcastle actually worried Leeds a little bit. I think Leeds were quite relieved when the game was over. Um, the equaliser's lovely. Brilliant assist from Callum Wilson. It looks an easy pass, but it's so beautifully weighted. Almond scores. Maybe we'll finally get rid of COVID. But then Leeds responded quickly with a great goal. Brilliant finish from Jack Harrison. It was so pleasing to see Harrison back on the left and Rafinha back on right. I still don't know what that was about against Brighton in terms of them switching sides. It just didn't work. So if you own either, 
then it's nice to see that they've gone back on what I think is the better side for both of them, respectively. Uh, Bamford is beginning to become a concern. For quite so it's a three games people. without a return, and then you factor in one blank game week in that as well. So it feels like four weeks ago. Yeah. So the time and then FA Cup in between as well. So it's, it's not... It, like two, three blanks is not a lot of blanks, and when considering he returned the two previous games, <clears throat> but the the fact that there's a blank and then the time that it's spread between his watch concerning it feels like months ago that he scored. Yeah, <clears throat> he scored in big games this season. It's worth saying. So I don't. I wouldn't look at the next two and go, oh, it's Leicester and Everton. I can't see him scoring. I mean, I, th- I think what's really concerning about him, and I haven't looked into the numbers, but it doesn't feel like he's having the chances. Because I own him in the Sky game, and we obviously keep an eye on shot tiers quite shot a tiers. lot. Yeah, sure. Not really had them in recent games, and previously was always at least having the chances. It feels like he's at least not getting them on target when they're coming at the moment. He had one half chance for header in the first half, which went well wide. It feels like he, for whatever reason, he's not quite having the chances at the moment. Um, I wouldn't panic to get rid, particularly if you've built up really nice value in him. But genuinely... Watkins and Antonio would both be better options, in my opinion. For me, it was a case of, well, I can't get to a Man City player with this in this position. So it's not the priority. The priority for me had to be get a Man City and the third Man City player. And that's why he's still sitting there. In a roundabouts where I probably would have rather sold Bamford than Rafinha, but that, that just didn't work for me. Yeah, I understand that. Um, in terms of uh, Bamford and Wood, so I'm, I'm going to sell Wood for Watkins. I mean, I'd, rather have still- ba- I'd rather have Bamford than Wood. Yeah, sure. exactly. So, because after this week, okay, they got Leicester away this week, but then Everton, Palace, Arsenal, Wolves, Villa, West Ham. It's a fairly good, consistent run all the way up to game week 27. Um, and what's the status on Leeds in terms of doubles? <clears throat> well, we know that 29, they'll play Fulham. That's the one game we're 100% sure on at the moment. And yep. obviously, obviously, they can play in 26 with a double as well because they've got the Southampton game to rearrange. Whether that happens or not might be quite dependent on who else goes through in the cup? Um, because, for example, uh, City have obviously got to rearrange a game with Southampton as well. And should Tottenham or Southampton go through in the cup, Tottenham and Southampton for 29 be, need to be rearranged as well. My instinct is that Tottenham are going to play Villa in 26. Yeah. That's my instinct. And, I've, and I, I, that makes me think that it really opens up the possibility for Leeds Southampton. To sum up, basically, any team that's got a game to rearrange from postponements, could pl- could double in 26. It's as simple as that. Um, and obviously, anybody else who reaches an FA Cup quarterfinal or their opponents in 29 does, obviously can also double in 26. But there's no guarantee that whatever gets postponed in 29 will go into 26. The example being, as I said previously, Sheffield United and Villa will be off if Sheffield United play uh, beat Bristol City in the FA Cup fifth round. But Villa have still got to rearrange games with Tottenham and at Everton. So there's no guarantee that Sheffield United and Villa goes from 29 to 26. The priority I would have thought is to sort out Tottenham's problem. That's why I think Villa Tottenham is most likely to go into 26, which means Sheffield United and Villa could go somewhere random, right? Um, Later in the season. So yes, Leeds Leeds are one of those who could double in 26 and they will definitely play in 29. Southampton won, uh, Arsenal three. We did think Arsenal might have a chance of picking something up because... uh... Southampton had a couple of injuries. Really? When I said I thought Arsenal would win on on the differential show, um, you 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 were, oh yeah, but then you did <laughs> funny check noise out came the, out of you. Uh, injuries that Southampton did have. I mean, Romeo didn't play right, and he's such a big part of the defensive setup. The, to be honest, the bigger problem was the fullback positions because actually Diallo played played quite well. He actually ended up playing the end of the game at left back, but he was quite good in midfield. Diallo he was a good little player. Okay. Um, the, the fullbacks were the bigger miss, Bertrand and Walker Peters. Just the balance of the team didn't feel right, didn't feel like they could create overloads. Um, Southampton's most impressive player, particularly in the first half, was goal scorer Stuart Armstrong. Yeah, really looked like he took ownership of the game. Um, he's another one falls into that value. He was one we really wanted at the start, wasn't it? And then oh, 5.5 million, I don't know, yeah. all day long. Well, yeah, but you, you you wouldn't now compared to the other guys, which no, he doesn't, no, he doesn't come no. in the conversation, but he played really well actually Stuart Armstrong um, Arsenal defended really well there were times in the second half where they got really deep and Southampton went hunting the ball when Arsenal played out and Southampton did some parts of that game quite well but 
I know you laughed me out of house when I said it's kind of 10, 11 game weeks ago that Arsenal won the best defensive sides in the league. But I, I think in terms of the shape and the way they set up when they're winning games, they one of the teams that was more reliable to hold on to a lead once they get ahead, you know. They, okay. they, 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 in terms of their setup, individuals, they might not be as good as others. But in terms of their setup, they're happy to sit deep, soak up, and then play through teams when they, they win it back. Um, Cedric, by the way, played really well for Arsenal at left back. Um, what he did really interestingly is something that Arsenal don't do often, which is switch to play. Right. Um, he's technically quite a good player. We've seen him back at Southampton take the odd free kick and stuff. So he was regularly looking for Saka on diagonals, and it's not something Arsenal do much. An interesting spin off of that, of course, is Saka stayed on the right despite the fact that Pepe played. And Pepe played on the left. And we haven't seen that before. Um, it's difficult to gauge whether it worked or not, although he, he obviously scored a lovely goal himself, Pepe, and Saka got a brilliant goal as well, although McCarthy should be staying on his line. I don't know if that will stick or not with Pepe on the left. He, he well, had a couple... Bam Yang is, is, is dealing with some personal circumstances. Well, personal there is that as well, obviously. So if if Aubameyang was to come back into the team, then I, th- I think Pepe would be the one that's dropped straight you away. Would, you would think so. You would think so. But as I said, Smith Rowe with his potential injury, which Arteta said he probably wasn't going to play 90 minutes anyway because he'd been carrying an injury into the game. So it could be that it was just fatigue. We don't know at the moment. It could be that perhaps Saka would go back into that area and Pepe would go back to the right. I mean, look, Pepe is not an FPL interest. But um, it was just interesting to see him play a different position for the first time here. Uh, Saka's the one that's really interesting because he's now returned in uh, five of the last six games, goal or assist. And it feels like uh, all the kind of good work that he had previously been doing is now turning into end product more than anything else. Uh, and I think a lot of that probably is just down to confidence and the team is now back to winning ways and suddenly he's like, okay, I'm a first choice starter here. I'm a big part of the team and the confidence has a massive part to play in the end product suddenly be in there. Um, he's up to 5.4 million. He was quite a bit cheaper a little while ago, but he's still cheap and his ownership is, is relatively low at 11%. What's interesting about him, that period I spoke about, game week 10 to 20 he's, in that period he's the ninth highest fpl point scorer wow do you remember do you remember when we did a pod um it must have been before that period and we looked at midfielders between five and six million and he was the one where the underlying numbers really looked good like he could potentially break out yeah and, and, we, and he, but we were worried at the time that he'd get chucked in at left back and well, wing back and here there were, there everywhere there were lots of question anymore. marks no no he has to play as one of the attacking three behind the front man the issue for him is he's got 62 points in say them 11 game weeks but Suchek and Gundogan have got more <laughs> yeah yeah so um, do you want yeah. three players at that value well th- so to, to give another angle to that, I've got three forwards. I'll end up with three forwards in Wood, uh, sorry, uh, Watkins, Bamford and Antonio at 6.2, 6.3, 6.7. So I don't need cheap midfielders. Like, I don't need a lot of them. I've got Suchek. So I've got, I'm have got. i going to end up with too much money to burn if I end up buying cheap midfielders Is and you, cheap strikers. Let, let's say you had all three players, Gundogan, Saka and Suchek, Suchek. right? Yeah. Presumably with that, you're going to have two powerful mids. Let's assume at the moment Fernandez and Salah or Son, whatever, right? So you're probably going to want to play those five, the majority of game weeks, which means you're going with a front two. Like, where is the rest of your money? Yeah. This is the, that's so the crazy I, thing. At I, the moment, I don't so. see, whereas take me, you could say, I could go from Lookman to Saka and I could have those three players. Now, at the moment, I'm giving myself benching headaches as it is. But Gundogan at the moment, you just wouldn't leave out. I'm not sure I want to be making a choice every week between Suchek and Saka. Suchek and Lookman, nine times out of ten, I'm going to pick Suchek. This weekend coming is a rare weekend where I think I'd, I'd be happy to pick Lookman. I'm not yep. sure I'd want that Suchek-Saka decision. And my idea anyway, with those three players, Suchek, Lookman and Gundogan, the idea for me in the in the short term at some point is to get that one of them up to Grealish. That's what I want to do. So it's not a case that I even want three players at, at that value. At the moment, I couldn't make a case for Saka over Suchek or Gundogan. Sure. If if you've got like treble city defensively, then I think Saka's potentially quite interesting. Yeah. 
Uh, let's talk about Man City smashing West Brom 5-0. But I think the majority of people that are listening will have at least seen the highlights, and if nothing else, seen the game. It, it's just the City of old, like you mentioned earlier, moving the ball quickly. Uh, you don't know which players in which position at any given time. Who's the false nine? Is it Sterling? Is it Morris? Is it Gundogan? Foden drifting in. Yeah, pressing you. They'll nick the ball and it'll be in the back of the net within 25 seconds. Scary, scary stuff. Yeah, they've hit peak. And they've hit peak without Kevin De Bruyne. Um, <laughs> well, let's let's not forget that the season before last, he basically missed the entire season and they wrapped up so many points and won the yes, league comfortably it's, without it's, him in an entire year. So maybe true. he's the fucking problem. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin De Bruyne. Oh, dear. <laughs> I've already told Man Child that the title for this pod is Gundogan, but yeah, maybe KDB <laughs> is the problem would probably make a better title. Um, KDB is obviously not the problem. Yeah. It makes it very difficult from an FPL point of view because you you know pick one anyone at any it, given and day. Stick with it. Um, but but yeah, the, the the ultimate thing is obviously uh, Man City have the biggest backlog of fixtures over anybody else. They're still in every single competition, and they're playing well. And their defenders are priced fairly. Right, you can have three of them at less than six million pounds. Uh, Foden, Gundogan, they're all decent. Just load up as best you can and just stick with it and ride yeah. it out. That's it. Simple. I mean, there's no thoughts for me. I obviously had the choice of buying Diaz and Cancelo this week. Obviously, hindsight, I wish I'd bought Cancelo, obviously. But as I said earlier, my, my explanation on that is I see three doubles coming up for Manchester City, potentially. And I'd rather have the guy that I know is definitely going to play. And by the way, he is well due of a goal from a set piece as well. And Sheffield United, defend them fucking badly as seen again actually last night in spite of their outstanding win at Old Trafford um, he's due Ruben Diaz as well he's next so we've had Stones Hall Cancelo's hold and Diaz is next um, not that I, could, I really believe that over Cancelo because I think Cancelo could haul again any week we knew yeah. this we knew this had been coming so far yeah, I, he's a brilliant player we, we knew this was coming the risk always is you, you, the, the the FPL manager in you straight away thinks, oh, he's played all 90 minutes there. Is he now getting a rest against Sheffield United? And there's nothing to suggest he will because he's played nearly every game. But that would na- nag at you, wouldn't you? You would think yeah. they've got a tough schedule coming up, Champions League restarting soon. Where do they want to leave him out if they're going to give him a break? Well, it probably is this weekend, isn't it? But I'd still say he's 80% will probably start. Yeah. But Diaz, you'd be more like 95%. I mean, essentially, this weekend, because they're playing Sheffield United, and they've obviously got another game in midweek, and they're playing weekend midweek ongoing. A little bit like the game in the midweek gone, any of them could get left out, bar Edison. This yeah. particular game week is a possibility. That said, if you haven't got three Manchester City players at the moment, that really is what you should be sorting out in your team at the moment because you've still got two very good fixtures. Sheffield United, Burnley away is tough for everybody, except Manchester City. At the moment, you'd fancy him to win at Anfield even, wouldn't you? Yeah. At the moment. <laughs> then it's Tottenham, Arsenal. Okay, they're difficult games, but City in this mood, those fixtures hold no fear. And we obviously think there's a strong possibility they'll double in 24, 26 and 27. The only consciousness in my mind now, having got Diaz, Stones and Gundogan, is what am I going to do with KDB's fit? And at the moment, the probable thinking is, well, I'll just leave it. Yeah. And it means that if I haven't got KDB, then I've got something like Son Fernandez and and uh, Salah instead Salah. or something. Exactly. Or, yeah. or Kane, whatever. Some combination of other premiums. And I've still got three really good Man City assets. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, like it, that was what had to be sorted for me, was getting the third Manchester City player. I'd seen enough on Tuesday and with the price going up. There was nothing else to think Time about. To Especially for me as well. The, the, I've kind of stressed about not making early transfers. But like I'm bust this week with James Justin first sub. So to be honest, let's just say, heaven forbid, a Robertson, Salah or Kane got injured tonight. I'll probably just roll with James Justin this week and then sort it yeah, out yeah. next week. Yeah, honestly. Right. Um, West Brom have Fulham and Sheffield United in the next two. I mean, we, we already think they're pretty much basically down and out. But if you're talking about Big Sam coming in and fixing things up, uh, and, he, <laughs> and let's not forget, Bilic got fired after a nil-nil draw against Man City. They've just gone and now lost 5-0 to 
to Man City, admittedly a different beast of, of Man City, if they lose to Fulham and Sheffield United or don't get at least six points out of the next two, then we can say goodnight. To don't Westbrook. at least get six points out of the two. Can well, I be honest with you, They've got to get six points. I think, and I'm not joking, I think that if they lose to Fulham and Sheffield United, they'll sack him. I'm not joking. What's the point? Well, Uh, but historically, they move very quickly. And I think they would then just take a decision and go, fuck it, we're down. This isn't the guy we want at our football club long term. Let's just change it. Is it the fact that uh, Rafa quit his Chinese job in Dalian or wherever he was that's thinking, let's go and try and get him? Have they got their eyes on Frank Lampard? Like, what, what are they going to? Where are they going to go, and who are they going to get? Oh, I could see that Frank Lampard. Yeah, <laughs> West Brom. I don't I think you want to give up uh, the uh, West End of London for West Brom. No offense intended. I played four home games under Sandro because he's seventeen goals. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. You think the one thing you'd get out of Sandro lucky there ain't a crowd there. Your defense. <laughs> Man. Especially if there was a crowd there with them results, mate. Jesus, <laughs> incredible! Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's Fulham, the, you'd fancy Fulham to beat them at the moment. Oh, yeah, 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 100%. Uh, Burnley three, Villa two, early game yesterday. I mean, Villa dominated in terms of chances, created five big chances, lots of shots. And Burnley do what Burnley did, they did, they still did all right, they created a, a number of chances. But did you watch this game? I watched bits of it, I didn't watch all of it religiously. I've only seen the, the highlights because you told me you'd probably watch it. So I really yeah, got I was the, trying to get I've get really it. got the short straw with Chelsea and Wolves, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um so I haven't seen the full uh, much more than extended highlights of it, but I know that from what I've seen and what I've read that Villa should have had the game won I mean, by half time. Yeah. But this is not the first time with Villa where they've been the better team and haven't come away with the points. We talked about it probably about two or three weeks ago. All the games where they'd lost leads late or hadn't won games they should, including like West Ham and so on and so on. And this this goes chalks it up again. Um, one I was I was fearful that West Ham we'd drop down eighth, ninth in the table eventually because the teams below us with games in hand are gonna win their games, etc. And Villa were one of the teams that I thought are, are easily gonna catch us. They've gone and blown a, a good opportunity against Burnley. Well, I think it speaks volumes for Villa that while I was watching the Chelsea Wolves game, when it came through that that Burnley went ahead, I was like, oh, nice, get him. Take yeah. that. I'm pleased with that because they're, they're a threat to my team in the race for top four. And with games in hand, they still are, by the way. They are a good team. I mean, Oh, yeah, no doubt about Grealish, it. They're going to keep playing well. Grealish from uh, all the guys and the, the patrons on the Slack channel were saying like he's comfortably mad at a match even though like, he lost and stuff. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. He, Watkins, uh, Martinez are all really strong FPL assets, in my opinion. And if you're sitting there with all three of them, I really wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> I just keep swimming. I'm more looking out to get to them. Yeah. Uh, that that result doesn't bother me. You look back on that. I think their XG was like two goals better than Burnley. I mean, it was like 0.5 versus 2.5, something similar to that. Should have won the game. No doubt about it. The goals even, the first one's a set piece, which can happen against Burnley. The second one is probably cross of the season from Dwight McNeil, but actually ends up going into the goal directly. I mean, and he nearly f- did that against us. He, his, his cross hit the bar in the end, if you remember. Beautiful Dwight technique. Yeah. Um, and the, the third one is a great header from Chris Wood. And I think it really caught Martinez by surprise. I think most of the time he would actually save that. Um, but, you know, it's gone in off the post. It's one of them things. They haven't taken their chances, haven't won the game. It's typical of Burnley as well. So, obviously, they stay with it. They keep going. They never give up, etc. cetera. Um, I'd be surprised if they scored three goals in another game this season. I feel like that's only put them on 13 goals or something, I want to say, I Burnley. Mean, yeah, but who cares? It's put them nine points clear of Fulham. And they're as good as safe now. We sat here this time yeah, last week yeah, or yeah. last Monday and we went, we're not worried about them. And again, what's happened? Oh, they've just beat Liverpool away and Villa at home, two of the two of the best teams in the league, right? And and uh, and now you look at it and go, oh, Chelsea next. They will get beat at Stamford Bridge, won't they? But will they? Uh, well, they do this do, every this... year. They get a run of results when you don't expect it. Every year it happens. I'm still going to sell my Burnley assets in Chris Wood and probably Lowton eventually, although he's low priority to move on at the moment because they just don't need to. Um, Talk to me about this Chelsea Wolves game then. 
Thomas Tuchel. Tuchel. I, I, I know how to pronounce his name, but I feel like it's a name that I can muck around with. Tuchel, Tuchel, Thomas Tuchel. Uh, Thomas Tuchel's in, although I don't think he had enough time to turn the team around. Clearly not yesterday. Pretty much started with a very similar back four that they'd had previous games. Zuma didn't come back in. No, it was a back three, uh, Well, I don't know if... Uh, uh, who played in the middle? I thought it was so, Rudiger and... Or maybe the, the, when I looked at the lineup. Rudiger, Thiago, Azpilicueta played right-sided centre-half. Right, OK. Uh, and- Chilwell played left wing-back. And hudson Adoya played as high as I've ever seen a wing-back play. OK, so he was <laughs> a wing-back. Literally play. played as a winger, as a technical wing-back, but he was so high. I mean, he didn't have to do any defending in the game. I mean, the way Chelsea finished, they basically finished the game in a 3-2-4-1 because their wing-backs... hudson Adoya ended up at left wing and Pulisic was playing right wing. That's what they had because uh, they had so much domination of, of the ball, if not the game as such, because Wolves were quite comfortable. I don't know if that will stick. It's one game. Um, one thing I would suggest is maybe that changing the system immediately just change mentality and make, gives a freshness of something new. Tuchel has played back threes um, in the past, but generally favours a back four. As Piliquet is an interesting player, suddenly, I'm not saying buy him for FPL, but what he obviously allows is in-game transition quite seamlessly. So if he's playing, and this has always been the case, if he's playing right-sided centre-half, in a moment Chelsea can flip to a back four, right? He goes right back, Chilwell goes a little bit deeper, suddenly you're at 4 2 three, one, four, three, three, whatever you want to do with it. And it might be a little bit of that, because he doesn't know the players as well at the moment, that he's kind of judging in-game I'm thinking a player like Azpilicueta is really useful because I can change the system in-game. We said pre-game, the only Chelsea player we'd consider is Rhys James and we <laughs> weren't in the team. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jorginho in the team is one of the things we suspected might happen because he tried to buy him for PSG. Right. So he's a player that we knew in the past that he had some interest in and would probably like. Um, I think for games like this, that's all well and good because they'll keep the ball for fun. But the one thing with Jorginho is it slows the play down a little bit. And Chelsea are at their best when, I mean, hudson Adoy. I don't know how many crosses he put in the game, but it felt like he put 10 crosses in, in the first 15 minutes. It was literally just bang, down the right, cross it, which with Giroud on the pitch, great. It's what you want him to do. But Wolves are also, once they go back to the back five, are quite comfortable when balls come into the box because they know they're not going to get outnumbered. Um, so I'm not sure whether the system will stick. Um, I'd be a little bit concerned if I was a Ben Chilwell owner as well, though he started this game, because I feel like the next the next game it could easily be from the way they finished the game, Hudson Odoi at left wing back and Reese James at right wing back, for example. So there for me, there was nothing in that game to make me think, oh, I know what's gonna happen next. I'll go and buy a Chelsea player now. I wouldn't know where to start. Yeah. Bernard was sub, Abraham was sub, Mount was sub. James was sub, Zuma was sub. All of these guys, he might decide with all of them, I want to have a look at them against Burnley. It's possible. So I wouldn't be buying their assets. And, and like I said, if you own a few, like Chilwell and that, I'd be concerned. I think Reese James, as long as you've got a bench, I wouldn't panic yet. No, I mean, I we, we know just off performances that he's, he's too good a player. Starting. Exactly. So he will work his way back in. I mean, we, we at the start of the season, we were thinking... Azpilicueta surely got the shirt because of historical, but Reese James is just a better player than Azpilicueta. So, to be honest, if if the, generally he wanted to go that way long term with a back three with Hudson Odoi right wing back, Reese James is such a good footballer. I could see him getting into the team in central midfield. Okay, interesting. He can play there. He's good enough. Yep. Um, so I wouldn't panic just yet. I, they're in but no buy. They're in no buy sure. zone for me. They look like in the first fifteen minutes they were going to win the game easy. Like I said, they really started with a higher tempo. Once Wolves survived that bit, and they didn't have to survive any big chances, by the way, but Chelsea were, you could, he had that feel, new manager in charge, and we're right up for it. Once they weathered that, it just became of let Chelsea have the ball. And Jorginho and Kovacic, it's all lovely. They want to pass the ball sideways all game long, and Wolves are thinking, great, I'm going to let you pass the ball sideways all game long. And they were relatively comfortable, relatively comfortable. And, and to be honest, in Neto's chance where he scooped it over, mended it, went over the bowl, though there may have been an offside against Podence, that actually ended up to be the best chance of the game, basically. And Wolves could have nicked it. 
would have been undeserved. Yeah. They need to, to be honest, Neil Neil was a fair reflection of what I watched, mate. It was a hard watch. No, I don't think either of us watched Brighton Fulham. Um, it sounds like pretty similar. <laughs> I watched um, the majority of the. Harrison. I watched the majority of the first half and I watched the last 15 minutes. Um, and what I can tell you is that Brighton should have won the game. Um, Ariola made some really good saves. I've spoken about him before. I think he's a good keeper. Uh, it was a game that Fulham really couldn't afford to lose because there's a gap between the two clubs and they couldn't afford to, to become free on top of that, really. But Fulham could have won the game at the death, right? Lewis Dunk cleared an effort from Loftus-Cheek off the line. Cavalero went back up front, as as I suspected would probably happen. I, I do think, as I said at the time, it was a case of getting Lookman to avoid wan for that particular game against Manchester United. Uh, Mario Lamina is back fit for Fulham, which I think is quite important because I think him and Anguisa give him real power, essentially. I, I don't dislike Harrison Reed as a footballer. He's really good at breaking up the play. He reads passing lines quite well. He intercepts well. Um, but I think Lamina and Anguisa give Fulham the ability when they play together to control the game. Particularly when you've right. got Loftus-Cheek ahead of that. Becomes a really powerful midfield, actually. They'll be better for having Anthony Robinson back for the game at West Brom this weekend, um, which I guess possibly puts a little bit of doubt on Lookman's position in the team, actually. Because what ended up doing last night was Aner at left wing back, basically. It dropped Brian from the game against Manchester United. Robinson will come back in, definitely. Kenny Tete's built himself up now to think he's probably first choice at right wing back. So one of Decordova, Reed or Lookman, I would have thought misses out, personally. Brighton, same thing that we often say about them. Nice. Don't score enough goals. Um, the positive, of course, is two clean sheets in a row, following, yeah. obviously, the excellent win at Leeds as well. Um Lewis Dunk, again, really good at centre-back. It was his clearance, obviously, on the line right at the end of the game that saved them. You talk, you talk, spoke at the start about teams that you just wouldn't want to go anywhere near at the moment. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. The, every week, there's a question. Is who's is, is X nailed from Brighton? Right, I can tell you there's only two players nailed at Brighton. They're Dunk and Webster. If you Manchester? ask me... For, no. You don't even I, think no, no, well, no. Well, now that Matt Ryan's gone to Arsenal? No. Christian Morton's back fit. I wouldn't say that's nailed. I, I, I don't think he's good enough for yeah. to, to have the confidence to say he's going to be their goalkeeper for the rest of the season. He's definitely number one at the moment, don't get me wrong. But in terms of 100% certain, I mean, listen, he plays at the weekend. He's just kept two clean sheets. But if you want a goalkeeper for the long term, and generally you're not buying a goalkeeper for one or two game weeks, I would not go down that route. There are better options at cheaper. Uh, Webster and Dunk are the only two. Anybody else is not nailed in that team. They'll be better when Lamptey comes back. That's fairly obvious. I'm pleased that my team's going to play them at the weekend and I assume that Lamptey won't be fit because the dynamic of them is extremely different with and without him. Yeah. Uh, Everton won, Leicester won. <clears throat> we thought that this was going to be a tight game and a difficult one to call. Uh, Leicester had, from what I could see, Leicester had the better of the first half and then Everton managed to get their noses in front and Leicester obviously called it back. Um it's probably what we would have expected in the end, a 1-1 out of Everton-Leicester. Uh, the equaliser was coming like when it came. And when it came as well, I think anybody who was watching that game like I was probably thought, Leicester are going to win this now. Because yep. they were so dominant. Um, it was a nightmare minute for Pickford because the original cross is going out. What, another play. one? Yeah, it happens, doesn't it? Uh, Gareth Southgate was there watching it as well, by the way. Oh, like, nightmare. But, but like, was he? <laughs> <laughs> like was he we've actually got some half decent other goalkeepers Gareth yeah that if the first one's going out behind for a goal kick and he pushes it out for the corner then from the corner he flaps at it and then obviously the shot comes through him now I definitely he saw it very late but it's one of them and you have a few of these a season and I just think kick it that is, if it's come through that fast and you're seeing it late, it's not one where he's diving out full stretch, where if he doesn't go over his hand, he's obviously getting nowhere near it. He's quite close to his body. So to, they're, the, they're almost the hardest ones for goalkeepers. You think, oh, it's straight at him. But it's not straight at him. It's slightly, it's like a foot to the right. So he needs to get his body down at a really awkward angle. Yeah. If it's a defender on the line, I'm telling you, if there was a defender on the line rather than Pickford, he obviously wouldn't use his hands and he'd kick yeah. it away. I'm yeah. certain of it. 
And I don't know, I don't know why goalkeepers don't do that. Yeah, the instinct. De Gea is obviously the one who's really good at saving with, with his, his feet. feet. Yeah, Allison's not bad either. I don't know why a goalkeeper in that instance as well, when it's coming through a crowd and it's close to your body, if you save it with your hands, there's only two places it can go. If you're really good, you'll get it to the side, but you ain't going to push it out for a corner because it's too close to you, or you're going to push it back into trouble. And I think that's part of what happens here is he gets down late, his body's in a bad position, he thinks, fuck, I can't push this back out as well. I need to try and get it to the side if I can at all and get it round the post. He obviously wasn't confident enough for whatever reason to claim the thing within his body. And then it, it just ends up looking fucking bad. Anyway, that's a goalkeeper moan. Someone from the goalkeeper's union will tell me I'm completely wrong. <laughs> um, what about assets? You're looking at Everton. I mean, Dina is still pushing forward as a as a wing back. I saw you tweeted yesterday. Left midfield, not, uh, not wing back, left sorry. midfield. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and obviously Rodriguez is back. Dominic Calvert Lewin played in the cup, didn't he? Um, and and so now we know he's fit. So we we spoke about this with Dean after they beat Wolves. Now this is, it feels like a long time ago, but this was their first league game since. And we spoke then about this would be one to watch if Calvert Lewin's going to be out for a while. Calvert Lewin back last night. Hammers back. Richarlison fit. All playing. Richarlison plays right midfield. Hammers plays in the hole as a ten. Luca Dean left midfield. Now there's, there's two ways of thinking about this. One, obviously, Decore was suspended and obviously Alan is still out injured. And even just Decore being back at the weekend could mean that that changes because he might have a little bit more trust in what's happening in the midfield. But I think that's part of the issue and why I think this might stick because I don't think he likes any of those options like Gomez, Davis or dropping Sigurdsson into a deeper position. I don't think he likes any of them. Yeah. So I think he's beginning to think that until he buys another midfielder, he might just go with Decore and Allen as a two. Now, obviously, you think Luca Dean left back. I really think that it's, and I spoke about this after the Wolves game, he doesn't want to drop Ben Godfrey. I think he thinks that if he takes him out of the team, it will be really harsh on him. And he's also conscious that he's playing him out of position as well because he's a centre-back, right? He's, he's no left-back. But he's doing a really good job for the team there. Also, it's another one where if they want to shift to three at the back in game, you just move Godfrey a long one, drop Dean in a little bit, and then suddenly you're playing three, four, two, one, and you play Richarlison in a more central area. So it also allows that that kind of flexibility with in-game as well. Six million, five percent owned. If he stays out there, he's really interesting. And oh my god, he's got Newcastle and Leeds in the next two. How do you fit him into your squad? That's you, the biggest challenge right now, he, isn't the, it? The answer, in my opinion, is if you've already got three Manchester City players. Yeah. I, I can't justify that as a minus four when I don't know if it's going to stick, yeah. personally. But I genuinely think what a brilliant differential to pick up this week. Yeah. There, there are another one. Look, good fixtures. Newcastle leads. Okay, then it's, it's United and Liverpool 23-25. They've got Fulham sandwiched in the middle. Could easily have a double in 26 of Southampton at home and Villa away or Southampton at home and West Brom away. So imagine if it's West Brom away, that actually becomes quite a nice looking double. We talked about avoid uh, Leicester because Vardy was out. Still, are you of the still same mindset? We had a lot of Madison versus Barnes uh, last week. Tiedemans was the one that actually got the goal and he's had a good four game weeks, but thing with him is feast and famine. If he went on a run of 10 games with no attacking returns, it wouldn't surprise us, would it? I, I sense that James Madison's beginning to feel ownership of his, his ability and his responsibility for the team. And I would still I would still prefer him. I know Barnes got the assist last night, but I mean, it's one of them is laid back to him. It could be anybody's assist. Um, he's always a threat as well, Harvey Barnes. There's not a lot between the two. I think I would have a slight favouritism for Madison personally. Yeah. Um, but not, but without, not, without Vardy, State. Yeah, I avoid. think it's okay. I think, to be honest, these two teams both fall into the category because of what they've got next. I mean, Leicester have got Leeds and Fulham. They both fall into the category where if you're quite happy with your team, this feels like a good week to go and buy from them. And I think for Everton, the priority would be Dean. And I think from Leicester, my opinion would be Madison just over Barnes. If you're looking very, very short term, I do think Ayosi Perez will probably stay up front. Because he doesn't like Iheanacho up front on his own. He likes Iheanacho when he plays with Vardy, but he doesn't like Iheanacho on his own. 
And I, I don't see that changing where he's going to go, oh, I'll play Ian Acho and Perez. Because Mark Albrighton's doing a really great job for Leicester on the right at the moment. The one caution to note on Leicester is possible hamstring injury for Wilfred and Diddy last night. It's not known if it's serious or not. It could be very minor and he could be back by next week. But that's one to keep an eye on because he has a huge impact on them. And it's not a coincidence that since his return, just psychologically, I think we all think, oh, stronger team, Leicester. I mean, my opinion is probably the best of what he does in the league and Diddy. I think he's a super player. Yeah. That's that's one to watch. You shouldn't be concerned if you own your Justins and stuff like that defensively. He's fine. Um, probably both teams will score at the weekend when they play Leeds. These are two interesting teams and two teams that are going to be near towards the top of it. Both have got a good cut of fixtures and they need to take advantage of it for their respective positions in the league. Everton can be in a position in the next two game weeks when really consider them a very strong top four contender but it could very easily go wrong for them as well. They have to I mean, be they Newcastle are, the weekend. Uh, they're joint on, on points with you with two games. So take top four as the West Ham on 35 points with 20 games. Both you and Everton are on 33 points with 18. So you could both get up to 39 points. Um, and that would be more than Liverpool, who can only get up to 37. So it could end up with Spurs, Everton, then Liverpool, and then West Ham. Yeah, and by um, the time... Uh, by the time you're listening to this, if it's Friday, that looks very, very different after Liverpool probably <laughs> won at Tottenham. All ifs, buts and maybes. But Everton, yeah, I mean, look, they put it this way. If they win the games in hands, they would go above Liverpool. Yes. Um, their run's not bad. Deservedly as well, let's just say, because they've been playing better and more consistent. I think they've managed the situation where they had the, the injuries and stuff really well. And it's full credit to they have an outstanding manager in Carlo Ancelotti. Oh, yeah. The way that, that that week where they beat Arsenal, Chelsea and somebody else, it was three tough games and they won them all. And suddenly it was like they dri- they dropped off. And then at the end of that week, Bang. they were back up to second. Yeah. was a huge week for them. They're in now. They're amongst the mix. They've got some good players. Indeed. Let's wrap up with uh, Manchester United one, Sheffield United two. I don't. I think I'm I'm, I'm too bitter to even talk about this because Rashford's for? blank for me three games in a row, and uh, Bruno didn't return. I just feel like Bruno I've been was let down. Regardless, it didn't matter, mate. I've been let down. Yeah, it's true. It didn't affect my uh, overall rank because everybody had captain Bruno. I understand that. But I feel let down. I mean, I don't know how the Manchester United fans feel, but I feel let down. I thought, you know what, United, I've been quite bullish with Manchester United and saying, yeah, I do think they are potentially, well, a couple of weeks ago, maybe title contenders and now are playing well enough, doing the ugly things well, and then they didn't. It's no concern here from Bruno Fernandes' owner perspective. No, no, there isn't. I'm not Just about to start selling none. the assets, but, but I still feel let down yesterday. I don't even think he's the worst captaincy shout at the weekend. I don't think that will be for me personally, but I don't think he's the worst shout. Um, No goals in four for Bruno, though. Which, I don't know, is that concerning or not? One assist in the last four. In in an odd way, you've got awkward teams in there. Burnley. They haven't had any penalties, have they? That's true. Liverpool's tough. Fulham, I mean, he should have returned at Fulham. Admittedly, he was nowhere near returning last night, particularly. Um, he didn't have a... He had one shot in the game that was blocked. I think that was that was about it. Um, some of his final passing wasn't as good as it had been at Fulham last week, for example. But no concerns. He's, he's a top draw player. I don't, uh, don't forget what happened on Sunday, right? Comes on and sticks on in the top corner. And on. I yeah, mean, I mean, just, we, if, if anybody's raging, like, uh, not raging, but, you know, don't forget what happened at the weekend, literally three days ago, four days ago. Correct. Uh, and that obviously gets hidden when you look at the Premier League stats. You're quite right to mention that. Um, this was a disaster, though, for Manchester United. A disaster. Um, they get themselves back in it, having not played well at all. It, it, we've had this with United a lot in the last, I want to say, eight years where they have certain fixtures and particularly at Old Trafford and they just get lethargic about it. And this was one of them. I don't think they ever doubted in their minds that this was going to be an easy game. And if they had to turn it on, they'd win it. They could. The problem was that second goal that they conceded 
watch it back and it's hard to fathom what happens because it's actually it's, it's quite a typical classic Sheffield United goal from last season where they keep doing the passing kind of in angles, in triangles on one side of the pitch. And they work the ball to Burke and he's free and the shot gets blocked and it goes back out to the same position on the right. And then it goes back to Burke and he's free again. Yeah. How does it happen? United had six players in the box. Sheffield United had three. And he's standing there looking at him. The guy's just had a shot, which you've had to get a last ditch block on. And now it's gone back to him five seconds later and he's still free. It's unfathomable how that can happen. And uh, you, you can't defend like that and expect to do anything, honestly. The, Gary Neville was very critical of United when they drew at Liverpool about how... It wasn't critical of them. It was critical of how deep they were in terms of not allowing Liverpool behind, etc. The problem is, for people like Maguire and Lindelof, and I know Lindelof didn't play last night, that's the best thing for them. Defend the penalty box. Have deep holding midfielders sitting in front of them. They're not good enough to be able to be playing a high line, etc. If the ball comes into the box, I fa fancy Harry Maguire to head it all day long. Don't have a problem with that. If the ball's coming into him, it's a physical battle. I don't have a problem with that. Where they have an issue is when they play against teams who can have space. Yeah. And Sheffield United probably thought it was Christmas. Uh, McGoldrick's missed the one-on-one, -on -one, which admittedly was offside in the second half, but close. Same in the first half. I mean, Billy Sharp got in behind off a high line. And Billy Sharp get away. 300-year-old Billy Sharp. Fucking hell. Um, Luke Shaw didn't play and it was noticeable. I'm not joking. He's yeah. been really good for them lately. It was just sloppy from United. I don't fancy Rashford or Martial as FPL assets. I do potentially fancy Edison Cavani if he can get his place in the team. I think United will be better of it. They've got enough pace and creativity in other areas of the pitch, which means that when they play against teams who are defensive like this, I'd want a man inside the penalty box who's got movement. And his movement in the penalty area is he's up there with the best around. So... Getting Edison Cavani in the team, I think, is a way forward for Manchester United. This is why, in my opinion, they won't win the league because they will have some shit results like this. Have to credit Sheffield United. Wasn't a fluke. Go and look at the XG. The XG between the two teams is basically the same in the game. This wasn't a case of United battered down their door. And I mean, listen, they're hanging on grimly after they score, but United didn't actually create anything. The closest they came to scoring was a deflected long range effort from Alex Tellez. Phil Jagiel at uh, centre back. We have to we have to single him out because A, he was brilliant. And B, we were very critical of him for getting brought on in the reverse fixture a month ago. We didn't understand it when you got all that pace running, running at you. But in this game, they went basic, they went very deep in the game without the ball. They let Manchester United have the ball. And at the moment, this is their best chance of trying to get results. That said, John Egan will probably come back into the team at the weekend. I think this was a, a one-off. Well played, mate. Thank you very much. John Egan will come back into the team. They're not going to score enough goals. It's a great result for them. Congratulations to them. They're not going to stay up. This doesn't change anything. Agreed with you on that. I agree with everything you just said, except one thing, which was that Marcus Rashford doesn't interest you as an FPO asset. I can, I can agree with you about Martial. For me, I think Rashford at any point, though, can really pop off. So uh, I, I'm going to stick with Marcus Rashford, primarily because I've got other things I need to do as well, rather than yeah, get, get rid that. of Marcus Rashford. Um, but Rashford down to Grealish, for me, is quite a good move because it frees up money and I prefer, I'd prefer to have Grealish, but I'm just not going to do it this week. Uh, to be honest, some of the players that we talked about and some of the moves I could make in my team, I'm almost tempted to just play the flipping wild card. I'm not lying to you. So... Uh, interesting, but I, I agree with everything you said about Manchester United there, except that I still do think Rashford could be a good asset. The the thing that's put me off a little bit with Rashford at the moment, is he's, he's been a bit niggly with injuries. Like he had a flag and then he's back in the team and then he's not. I want him to be 100% because he's reliant on his pace. And I've seen him live even when they when, when United came to us where he played the lone striker role and he was, he was not fit and he was it was pointless having him on the pitch. So Games games coming up are probably more interesting for Rashford, such as Arsenal. If they go in front in the game, 
and I'll talk about this just briefly and say, if they go in front in the game, then I can see Rashford returning later in that game, or obviously if he gets the opening himself. Southampton and Everton are better fixtures for Rashford in an odd way than this Sheffield United and then putting up a block of a back five, etc. So there's a difference between me saying I'm not interested and he's not a good asset. No, yeah. I don't think I don't think you should sell him. I'm not saying that at all. I think if I had Martial, I really would be thinking of selling. Um, Rashford's okay, and some of these fixtures which look tougher on paper might be more suitable for him. What I would say is they've gone ahead behind again in this game, and this time we keep saying eventually it'll catch up. Yeah, right? this time they didn't sell it. Right. It caught up with them this time. If Arsenal go in front at the weekend. I think United will get beat. Mm, okay, interesting. We shall see. Uh, and as as always, when we do our differential show for patrons on Fridays, we do go and run down uh, our predictions for all of the games. Although, having said that, don't sign up to our Patreon um, public service announcement. Patreon Monday slash Planet FPL, where you do, do get extra do podcasts, Slack channel, so much other good stuff. Uh, if you're listening to this before the 1st of February, don't sign up to our Patreon, but do after the 1st of February because it'll be a lot of fun and you will in. I still, I, still, I still see people doing it. I want to refund yeah, I mean, their money. You know, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, um, if people do it, yeah, let's, let's do that. If people really want to sign up now because they can't be, they'll forget or whatever, do it. If you sign up between now and the end of Feb, so that's the next three days, you'll actually get your this month's whatever refunded because it's only three days. You'll have to pay, but we'll refund it and then you'll get charged again on Monday. On Monday again. (laughs) That's the best, the easiest way we can possibly do it. If you really fancy it, otherwise wait till Monday. Um, So, should we have a few Twitter questions, James? It's a good rundown of the games. We do have... Is that it? Is that all the games? That's all the games, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because we was on M. I thought it was late to go. (laughs) Hour and a quarter we've been talking about. Oh, Jesus. Um, th- there are a few good, interesting questions, but truth be told, we have uh, we have wrapped up a lot because there is a lot of City conversation uh, about chopping and changing and jumping on, jumping off. I miss Cancelo. Should I now get him? I don't know if I should keep Foden. You, you stick with what you've got and, and hold your patience. Unless what you've got is something like Rodri or... <laughs> And you then I'm happy. That, right? yeah, if, if you are someone, someone owns Rodri, mate. Right? The, the the one that will pain people the most. Listen, Phil Phone, come back in at the weekend and kick it at trick, right? Yeah. Um, the one that would really pain you is Jesus. If some reason you've landed on that, he's such a frustrating player. And obviously, he didn't play. It's not his fault. He, if he played, he probably would have returned. Um, but he's so frustrating. He's so frustrating. I I think Guardiola's. He's had enough of him, I think, to be honest. Uh, I think a good start point on the questions, and probably the main one that we need to look at, is uh, comes in from Auto Reclose, Darren. He says, if you had to wildcard right now with the info that we have, what teams would you attack? And uh, I'll just add in, Rob Pick asked a question around Patrick Bamford. Is He seems to be fading. Is a move to DCL with their fixtures tempting? See, I, I was looking at wild carding because there's a number of moves I could make and, and four or five transfers. Suddenly I'm like, you know what? For me to go from where I am to where I want to get to, a wild card's not a bad shout. So uh, if I answer it first, you can tell me what your thoughts are as well. Yeah, my I'm thoughts are don't one... fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only on one Manchester City. So if I want to I want to treble up on Man City, that's Minus two four. <laughs> that's two transfers. I don't own any... Aston Villa assets, but my goalkeeper at the moment, I've got Ariola and Johnston that are not interesting. They're playing I'm each other the about, weekend anyway. So that's yeah, I'm I'm talking about moving on uh, 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 Wood for Watkins. So suddenly we've got, I've, I'm, and I want to move on uh, Rashford for Grealish. So that's five transfers. It gets me triple Villa and triple City. I already was sitting on triple West Ham. So suddenly I'm on an all-in strategy here. I'd get maybe, uh, I'd add in uh, two Liverpool. I've got Salah and uh, Robertson. Bruno Fernandes I'm already sitting on. So You've also now got about the... 25 players in your FPL squad, mate. Well, no, we've got Triple City, Triple West Ham, Triple Villa, Salah, Robbo, Bruno. And then the only other two to chuck in, I've got Bamford. And then I'd and probably pick y- up Reece James. Want, you don't want Kane or Son for the weekend, or you don't want Kane or Son against West Brom in game with 23. Them couldn't afford them so uh yeah i could then downgrade someone and, and upgrade a, a bamford to a Kane 
um, but it would be difficult to get to. So I may even move Bamford on to uh, uh, Dominic Calvert Lewin. But but the, the City, Villa, West Ham, Liverpool—they're all decent sides that you can pile in on uh, on a wild card. But I the would... question there was given the info that we have. So why don't you sprinkle in a bit of fixture related? Yeah, I can do. I, I would only wild card at the moment um, if a I, I would have to have the free hit chip left, which you do. Yeah, and, and I would, uh, <laughs> I would be targeting teams that I would expect to double in twenty six and have good runs. So, uh, quite a few times I've mentioned obviously City is the obvious one. City free City, you'd have to go down that route. Yes, it would then be Villa for me. I would want some Tottenham. If I was wildcarding now, generally I would go Kane and Son. I'd go with that. Um, then I think probably Everton. I would probably go Calvert Lewin and Luca Dean at the moment. I would probably go Nick Pope of Burnley because although they've got Chelsea and Manchester City next, they've then got Brighton, Crystal Palace and West Brom and then potentially a double. And that's, to be honest, that's screaming at me. That might be perfect move time for me actually to come off, say, Johnston and go with Pope for the double, knowing that I've got Ariola for the blank if I think that double's going to happen. And it's highly likely that Burnley will have a double in 26, which would admittedly it would be Tottenham away and Leicester at home, but it's still fucking Burnley. He'll get he'll get six, seven points off those two games just from save points, mate, even without yeah. a clean sheet. Um, so that's what I'd be targeting kind of in my head. I would still want to keep some Liverpool about it because I look at uh, midweek and I think, do I want to captain Salah against Brighton rather than what, what what alternative am I doing? Am I going Bruno against Southampton? Am I going City it's away? West Ham am, I, am, I going, am I going? Am I going? Am I going Gundogan away to Burnley? I can't shake the idea that I, I don't see me putting a, a, the armband on on someone like Gundogan. Um, so that's where I'd be targeting. But you haven't got the picture. That's the main reason not not to do it. Is you could wild card now, and what you think could happen, and then suddenly. Swansea beat Manchester City in the FA Cup. We know that's really unlikely. But suddenly we're looking at quite possibly a, a double in 24, maybe not happening, that we're expecting. Um, and then perhaps you want to target other teams and it doesn't look so good. You might be thinking, oh, could be Everton in that double with City in 24. And yes, I think that probably is the most likely one. But do we really want to get Everton players in because it's an extra fixture against City? There are fixtures that, I mean, Everton Tottenham, for example, take that as FA Cup fifth round. I see a lot of people assuming that West Brom and Everton is going to be in game week 29. But for me, Everton v Tottenham in FA Cup fifth round, that's a 50 50 call. I don't know how you could say either way. What I can say is Tottenham will almost definitely have a double in 26, irrespective. But it could suddenly be that Tottenham play Southampton in game with 29 because easily they could easily get beat at Wolves as well. Then your planning looks very, very different in terms of what you want to do. There is too much unknown beyond the next couple of weeks for me to be able to pull that wild card at the moment. I think, as I said, if you've got that free hit to cover the problem of 29, then there are certain teams you can target who are highly likely to double in 26. City, Tottenham, Villa probably Everton that's probably where you'd be going but then what you don't want a Bruno you don't want a Salah you can't just difficult isn't it bit more going. that's the beauty about the pricing of the City players and going with something like any combination of Cancelo Diaz Stones plus a Gundogan or Foden is it still allows you the big hitting Brunos and Salahs Salah plus a Kane team. or Salah or both from the other guys and that's that's the real beauty of the the, the cheapness of people like Gundogan and Foden at the moment you haven't got the picture, mate. Ne- never be certain what's going to happen in FA Cup games. Another example, yourselves, away to Man United. All right, we assume West Ham and Arsenal will play in 29. But that could very easily be um, that it, it, it becomes a double for West Ham in 26. United don't double in 26. They then play in 29, which then means what we said about Palace's nice fixtures. If you're thinking about a Zahara or Mitchell and bench boosting, you're then thinking, oh shit, that doubles off. Do I want to bench boost with Tyreek Mitchell against Fulham in 26? It's too much uncertainty, mate. Yeah. Too if you're, early, if you're, if you're planning, particularly if you're planning to bench boost in 26, Christ, wait. 
<laughs> Seriously, wait. If you're looking to bench boost in 26, please wait till game week 25 before you wildcard, or at least game week 24, where you should have most of the information. The problem with 24 and beyond, like City should have a double there, but I think they might even wait till after they play Swansea in the cup, because as I've said on uh, one of the previous, on the Skypod we did yesterday, if they lose to Swansea, they don't need to play in 24. And then the whole outlook potentially looks very, very different in terms of what you want to do. I yeah. genuinely wait. This is too much uncertainty unknown. And even people like, oh, Luca Dean and Calvert Lewin, your fixtures look better. A couple of blanks, you'll soon want to get rid of them and you'll feel differently. If they blank in New- against Newcastle and Leeds, you'll want to get rid of them. That's the danger with going for these type of players. They'll frustrate you quickly. So, uh, last thing to wrap up this pod, James. Captaincy for the weekend. Uh, give us your top five in order of what you would. If you, right, so I don't even know I'm going to captain at the weekend. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm I'm finding it difficult myself it's because it's the only other question that we've had in that's interesting. I mean, Tottenham obviously away at Brighton, Liverpool away at West Ham. As good as we've been defensively, I think it's still an interesting shout. Uh, and then Man City at home to Sheffield United. You own two defenders and a Gundogan. Are and you brave a, enough to captain I'd, one of I'd, those? I'd, I'd, I don't think I'm brave enough to put the armband Gundog in. I, I don't think I am. I, Diaz or Stones never smells like a captaincy unless it's a double, then potentially. Um, you need some balls again. I mean, to be honest, all the people who had the balls to put it on Cancelo this week, well done. You may well have the balls to do it again. I still think you'd, you'd need similar size grapefruits. As much as you probably need even bigger size grapefruits to do it this week. Um, so no to be honest for City I'd, I'd probably say the best shout from City right now would still be Sterling then Foden if you pressured me now I would say best shout for the weekend I'd probably say Raheem Sterling still um, From the at the moment I'm bust on Harry Kane it's quite straightforward for you as an owner I may end up with a Cancelo or Foden captaincy this weekend it's yeah it's okay I think Foden's the one that I'll probably end up going for. If my transfer ends up being Anguissa to Foden as opposed to Wood to Watkins, then that's the transfer that I'll be looking to make. City could make big changes at the weekend. They could also play exactly the same team. There we go. Uh, that's another episode in the can. Uh, I don't know what the title is going to be. Gun dogging or KDB is the problem, but I'm pretty sure gun dogging the way forward i hope you have uh, a good rest of the game week 20 tonight if you still have liverpool and spurs assets to go we'll be back at you next week with full podcasts james will be live streaming tomorrow uh if i am correct what time do you know Uh, i'll I'll do 3 p.m so i'll wait for most of the team news to filter in and the press conferences so do jump over to youtube forward slash planet fpl that's where you find us and that's where you'll find james tomorrow other than that most importantly wherever you may be I saw today, James, that globally there have been now more than 100 million cases of COVID. So stay safe wherever you may be. Ciao for now. Be nice to each other, everyone. Stay safe. Cue music, please, man. Shout.